And then there are the collects and the prefaces, whose ancient richness is so evident in the new translations that they will become a rich source for our homiletic, catechetical, and theological reflection for decades to come. Listen to the collect for the annual commemoration of the dedication of a church. O God, who year by year renew for us the day, when this your holy temple was consecrated, listen to the prayers of your people and grant that in this place pure worship may always be offered to you and we may receive the fullness of redemption through Christ our Lord. A similar richness is found in the commons of the Blessed Virgin Mary, but here we find a surprise as well. We fully realize for the first time that each time we commemorate she who was conceived without sin, we become conscious of our own sinfulness and of our own need for intercession. Grant, O merciful God, protection to us in our weakness, that we who keep the memorial of the Holy Mother of God may with the help of her intercession rise up from our iniquities. Or another example. Pardon the faults of your servants, we pray, O Lord, that we who cannot please you by our own deeds may be saved by the intercession of the mother of your Son, our Lord. What a wonderful phrase. We who cannot please you by our deeds. The third collect from the commons reflects the same theme but within the context of a typical Christmas meditation on the coming of Christ our light. O God, who willed that your word begotten from eternity should come forth from the virgin's womb, grant, we pray, that with blessed Mary interceding, he may illumine our darkness with the splendor of his presence and from his fullness give us joy and peace. The richness of these prayers is drawn from their thick formality and poetic character. Yet at the same time, these rhetorical forms make them uniquely capable of expressing intimacy, as in the preface for the Chrism Mass. Imagine standing with your brother priests as your bishop prays these words. It is truly right and just our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. For by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you made your only begotten Son, High Priest of the new and eternal covenant, and by your wondrous design, were pleased to decree that his one priesthood should continue in the church. For Christ not only adorns with a royal priesthood the people he has made his own, but with a brother's kindness he also chooses men to become sharers in his sacred ministry through the laying on of hands. They are to renew in his name the sacrifice of human redemption, to set before your children the paschal banquet, to lead your holy people in charity, to nourish them with the word, and strengthen them with the sacraments. As they give up their lives for you and for the salvation of their brothers and sisters, they strive to be conformed to the image of Christ himself and offer you a constant witness of faith and love. And so, Lord, with all the angels and saints, we too give thanks as we cry out in exultation. Thick theological reflection juxtaposed on the deep intimacy of bishop to priest and Christ to his people. There's a real beauty to the preface for the triumph of the Holy Cross, including a wonderful reflection taken from the fathers on the tree of Calvary and the tree of paradise. For you established the salvation of the human race on the wood of the cross, so that from where death arose, life might rise again. And the one who conquered on a tree might also on a tree be conquered through Christ our Lord. Through him, the angels praise your majesty, dominions adore and powers tremble before you. 
heaven and the virtues of heaven and the blessed seraphim worship together with exaltation we pray you bid our voices join with theirs as we acclaim in humble praise the difference between translations which truly reveal the original character of roman liturgical prayer and the former translations is particularly evident in the collects for the three masses of christmas Here's the new translation for the Mass of the Christmas Vigil. O God, who gladden us year by year as we await in hope for our redemption, grant that we who joyfully accept your only begotten Son as Redeemer may also be able to face him confidently when he comes as Judge. Notice how the prayer weaves all the themes of the Advent season together. Expectation for the Lord who's coming, hope, joy, and judgment. But notice by contrast how flat and didactic, stripped of all poetic enthusiasm, is our present translation. Additionally, it fails to convey the indispensable role of God's grace. God our Father, every year we rejoice as we look forward to this feast of our salvation. May we welcome Christ as our Redeemer and meet him with confidence when he comes to be our judge. The light imagery in the next Christmas collect makes us think of the church's flickering lights and the smell of candle wax at midnight mass. O God, who have made this most sacred night radiant with the splendor of the true light, grant, we pray, that we who have known the mysteries of his light on earth may also feast on his joys in heaven. And finally, listen to the Collect for Christmas Day, which from the earliest days of the church has been prayed when men and women like you and me respond to God's call to celebrate the wonders of his incarnation. It begins with our creation, recalls our need to be restored, and concludes with words used at the commingling at every Mass. O God, who wonderfully created the dignity of human nature and still more wonderfully restored it, grant, we pray, that we may partake in the divinity of him who humbled himself to share in our humanity. These new translations are going to be a challenge, but they're a wonderful opportunity as well. For the first time in the post-conciliar reform, the voice of the church will be available to all priests. That immemorial voice that from the earliest days was first spoken by the fathers. That scriptural language, that deep theological language, which can imbue the post-conciliar reform with a power that we cannot even begin to imagine. Each one of us will need to study those texts, to pray those texts, and to make them a part of us from the inside out in order for that to happen. On the day of your ordination, the bishop placed into your hands the sacrifices of the people of God in the form of bread and wine in a chalice and a paten. And there were three things that the bishop asked you to do on that day. To know what you are doing, to become a part of the mysteries that you celebrate, and to conform your life to the mystery of the cross. Through hard study and hard work, may we come to know the liturgy we celebrate in its authentic form. May we come to be so affected by those mysteries that we are transformed into the image of Christ from the inside out. And may we be conformed to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, before whom the heavenly liturgy is forever sung in the kingdom of heaven.